Hello everybody, my name is Mark Sage and I'm the Executive Director of the AR for Enterprise Alliance, the AREA, and welcome to the latest of our AREA Salt Leaders webinars. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm excited to be here today with um, one of our founder members of the AREA, Jim Novak from Talent Swarm, and he's going to be talking about creating digital twins in record time. Um, this the recording will be made available to everybody afterwards. Um, it should take about 30 to 40 minutes, and um, I'll remind you that you can ask questions in the questions box, but box, and I'll come back to that. Um, just before I hand over to Jim, just a quick introduction um, from the area. So, Jim, if you can move on to the next slide, please. There we go. So um, many of you will know about the area, but just for those who don't, the area is the only global membership funded not-for-profit alliance. And we're really there helping organizations accelerate the adoption of enterprise AR by supporting the growth of a comprehensive ecosystem. And, and these webinars are an element of um, that, that work as well. Next page, please, Jim. Just in terms of our membership, it's in three different segments. Um, so we have a number of enterprises that are working on and have deployed um, successful AR solutions. We have a bigger group of the providers of AR solutions, both hardware, software, consultancy, platform providers. Um, and then we also have a set of what we bundle under non-commercial or research organizations, so government agencies, research institutes, universities and standards organizations. And by bringing the, all of these um, excellent companies together, we're really learning from each other, helping to accelerate the adoption of enterprise AR. Jim, next slide, please. Then what we do boils down to what we call our four strategic pillars. The first one is about delivering thought leadership to the wider ecosystem, and today's an example of that work. What we're really trying to do is target the information that business decision um, leaders need to help them invest in AR. So really talking about the different use cases and the problems that can be solved, giving examples of those problems being solved in real life, helping understand what technologies are needed, and most importantly, we find is the ROI. Now, you know, Jim will be talking about that, but also please remember we do have our, our, our ROI calculator, which is available at the AREA website, um, www.thearea.org. The, the next pillar is about networking, it's about bringing the ecosystem together to learn from each other, to share those experiences and building those partnerships. We're very passionate about the educational side and making sure we have a steady set of skilled workers coming into the industry. So working with universities and educational organizations to help them develop their um, AR courses, to help do guest lecturing, set challenges, and help uh, enable outplacements. So anything we can do to bring a steady set of um, new and educated workers into the industry. And then finally, reducing barriers to adoption. We have a number of committees, which are monthly meetings, that come together and focusing on some of the key challenges that we see in the industry. And some of our committees are focusing on areas like the latest research, security requirements, safety and human factors. And um, so there's lots going on and it's a really exciting time for the augmented reality enterprise uh, ecosystem. Next slide, please, Jim. Just a reminder that we've done a number of webinars over a number of years. Um, you can access them through the area resources page. Um, and under the videos part, there's lots of archives, over 35, as I mentioned, webinars, podcasts. And you can also check out our area YouTube channel as well, where all of these recordings are stored. Uh, next page, please, Jim. And finally, just to say that there's a couple more um, webinars coming up under our thought leadership um, and research committee banners. Uh, if you go to the area.org events page, you can sign up to those as well. Um, and I'm super excited. There will be a whole 
agenda of new events being added as well. So please keep your eye on that page and look forward to hearing from you or seeing from you in future webinars. Anyway, enough from me, Jim. If you can go on to the last slide from me, please. So I'm going to hand over to Jim now. Just a reminder um, that if you have any questions at any time, please put them into the questions box. I will ask Jim at the end of the, um, the session today. Um, he will also be able to follow up with you. If we haven't got time to answer all of the questions, uh, we promise that we'll give you a kind of a written update as well. And um, without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to um, Jim Novak from Talent Swarm. Jim, please take it away. Thank you very much, Mark. And it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be part of AREA since its very beginning. Uh, good day to all of you that are on this webinar today. I'm going to focus on giving you the very best of our experience in terms of creating digital twins, how to um, get them approved and uh, quickly adopted by your organizations, which is not always easy. And I'm going to give you some examples of some of the tools that uh, are the most uh, efficient in terms of creating these digital twins. I also want to give you an experience, and for that we've uh, put together several videos, but given the constraints of bandwidth in uh, broadcasting, I've tried to reduce them to the minimum visible uh, viewing quality, so they might not be as proper or as uh, as nice to see as as they may be in in the original versions. And for that, uh, I'll remind you at the end. But also, I have a high definition version of this presentation for those of you that are interested in seeing them in their full glory. So uh, please excuse if some of those might be a little bit choppy um, or pixelated. Uh, that's just so that uh, we can get the most uh, visual experience in this webinar. Um, also, you know, don't forget to use the, the chat panel if you have some questions. Um, I have a view of that, so if there's something that wasn't clear, uh, please pop that in so that I can uh, address that. And um, also, I uh, want to insist that those of you who want to receive this recording can ask Mark at the area, and I also will give you my email at the end of the presentation. So, uh, none of us would travel today without this device. This device is the ultimate simulator of uh, 787 Boeing, and uh, none of us would get on a plane if we thought the pilot had not practiced uh, difficult maneuvers in a simulator like this. Yet we live next to complex industrial facilities without thinking that there are very few simulators of those industrial facilities that uh, keep us as safe as pilots do with the training they receive in these simulators. So digital twins, the digital twin concept is something that we've had for many, many years in many different forms, but obviously this is uh, the one that keeps, our, keeps us safe in the air. The digital twin uh, is a representation of the physical asset in a digital world. And what makes it much more useful is that now digital twins can actually be connected in real time to the physical asset so that it's not just a pretty picture, it's actually something that is alive with real-time information. And then if, it's, if that data is saved in the cloud or in, in secure storage, we have a historical archive of the operation of that plant that can be analyzed and uh, further efficiency gained from that analysis. But of course, Hollywood is always ahead of us in terms of what digital twins can be. That wouldn't bother me. It's just that they're, uh, it, can, you, can somebody just, sector 12. Okay, go, 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 stop. Stop, Rich, stop, that's Jesus. Their damn village happens to be resting on the richest unobtainium deposit within 200 clicks in any direction. I mean, look at all that cheddar. 
<laughs> that that last part is the evil laugh of him uh, seeking to uh, extract the obtainium from the uh, tree of life. From 2009, well, uh, less than 20 years, I should say, but uh, this, this shows a, a 3D holographic view of a physical asset in a digital world. And why do we create digital twins? Many of you already know, but operation and maintenance of the physical asset is 80% of the total cost of ownership of an industrial plant. And these, this comes from, from various studies that have been done uh, mostly on office buildings where the efficiency, man the high efficiency management of the asset can res result in 30% savings of, of, during that operation and maintenance phase so that literally the, the savings in the operation and maintenance phase is more than the original cost of design and construction of the asset. And where do these savings come from? As I mentioned before, a historical archive of the operation gives the ability to create a more efficient operation of that asset. Preventive or predictive maintenance allows the digital twin to help in avoiding unscheduled and very costly shutdowns. And finally, the digital twin allows the, the workforce around the world to collaborate in real time so that obviously those people, those highly skilled workers that now are more highly restricted in terms of travel can provide their services to the entire organization. And Gartner has identified in 2019, uh, 10 of the top strategic technology, technology trends. And amazingly, uh, digital twins, the immersive experience, augmented analytics, and blockchain, all which are part of a immersive digital twin, are four of the top tech trends in 2019. Uh, and this shows in terms of the, the market predictions for um, digital twins or more sophisticated digital twins, which actually are called um, product lifecycle management systems where you literally control the, the industrial asset throughout its entire life cycle. But let's get right to the, how do we create digital twins? And this is an actual example of, a, of the scanning of a facility in Spain, in the south of Spain, it's a desalination plant. And what we see here is a variety of devices. On the, the upper left, is a laser scanner from uh, ZF, Z plus F. It's a German company. And on the right is a Zeb Revo uh, scanner, which the person in the lower left is holding, which is a handheld scanner. The lower right image shows how the scan is then shown in terms of the positions that have been scanned. Each one of those dots is a position where the tripod of the, of the laser scanner up on the left has been placed. So to give you an example, this 2000 square meter facility was scanned in two days with about 150 positions of the tripod scanner. And the scanning was done to a precision of about uh, two millimeters uh, throughout the facility. Hello and welcome to the making of the digital twin for Safia Agua distillation plant. On upon arrival, we inspect the actual engineering plant itself and talk with all the engineers. Then we prepare the actual 3D laser scanning device. 
We then take the appropriate measures to remove all the panels. This allows us to scan all the pipes under the actual building itself. We then initiate the 3D scanning process. We further remove more panels. The 3D scanner is initiated coupled with a handheld 3D scanning device. This provides a 3D model which is remarkably accurate and gives a full representation of the actual plant itself. This effectively is your digital twin. Here is a perfect example of a pump room. After being scanned, it is then represented in a 3D model. You can zoom in and make the appropriate measurements. Cuevas de Almanzora in Almeria. We can navigate in a 3D perspective around the plant. Let's have a look inside. We can see all the industrial water pumps and we can jump to specific locations of the actual plant. The scans load and provides you with a 3D environment where you can actually look around. We would like to thank all the directors, managers and engineers for making this project possible. And of course, let us not forget the factory cat. Before we go on to the next scan, what I want to do is discuss a little bit uh, what what we saw. There was a, a laser scanner on a tripod, which was moved around the facility about 150 positions over the period of two days to scan about 2,000 square meters of the facility. Um, as you saw at the beginning of the, of the video, uh, we surveyed the entire plant to plan the scanning of that facility and removing the panels that would avoid being able to see all of the pipes. And given that this is something that people see as invasive to their facility, it's very important to get everybody's, um, everybody on, on board and have previous meetings to let people know what this is for and what's going to be done with the information because um, Otherwise, you can start to get some resistance from some of the, the operators um, that don't understand what, what this is going to be used for. Um, the, the, uh, the process went extremely well because we informed people that we were creating this model of their plant to help them manage it better. Um, without that kind of information given to the people involved in the plant, um, worse, you, you may be perceived as kind of an invasive force. So it's very important to have that uh, previous knowledge. Now, that handheld scanner that you saw is called the Zeb Revo, Z-E-B-R-E-V-O. This device that you're going to see in the next video is a Leica BLK2GO, blk 2 go Number two, go, and it's made by Leica. This device did not exist about a year ago when we made the, that, uh, 
that first video. But this, this device does the same thing as that handheld scanner, but it has some additional features, which I'll, dis which I'll show in, in this video. But literally this person is walking around the plant, oops, and creating a, a point cloud as they go. And now I can go ahead and start moving the scanner. Now as I walk on the app, I can see exactly where I started and a little trail to where I currently am. Now the data on the app is only a fraction of the total data that the blk to go is capturing, uh, but it does give you a good idea of what you've already captured. When you're looking at the 2D view on the app, uh, it's especially clear how the data is being populated uh, when you enter into a new room. This 2D preview is really helpful so you know exactly where you've already captured this data. Uh, if you tap on the 3D button, it'll bring you to a 3D uh, point of view, uh, view of the point cloud. Uh, so now I can see the point of view from the scanner uh, as I move through the, the cloud. Um, I can also pinch to zoom and zoom out so I can get a, a good view of the point cloud that I've already created here. Another feature uh, of the blk to go is the detail camera. If I want to take a picture with the detail camera, all I need to do is give the power button a quick press while scanning. You'll see that the, uh, the, the green ring will flash really quickly. Uh, and then about a second later, uh, you'll see a quick preview of the image on the, on the app. Now this, this uh, image will be located in 3D space uh, in the point cloud when you bring this data over. It's done automatically, so I'm gonna uncheck those. And now I'm gonna click import. Now I can see all my data here. I have two separate scans. Uh, and each one of these red dots represents uh, each of those panel images that I created. Um, if I want to go in here, I can say show in cloud viewer. And now I can zoom around um, this entire building that I've scanned. If I want to toggle off these red bubbles, I can use this button here. Uh, I can view this a couple different ways. Uh, I can do grayscale. Sometimes that's a little easier to, to see and just see the image from those, uh, those panel cameras. Now what, what I, I would like to do is, is uh, once we have those are two different ways of having uh, scanned the facility. One is with a uh, laser tripod with the Zeb Revo for, for constrained spaces. And the latest one is the Leica uh, BL, blk to go which is that handheld scanner, laser scanner, and photographic device that you saw. Uh, there are many ways of bringing that information into, um, into a uh, 3D model. Uh, but what, what we've done in, in Talent Swarm is we decided to, well, we talking with customers, they say, well, I have 3D models that I have for my CAD plans. Um, my maintenance people want to be able to walk around the plant and see what needs to be maintained, but maybe they want to inspect the uh, an area before they go out there to fix it, see what kind of scaffolding or stairs they might or or ladders they might need and what equipment they might need to take with them. And then the instrumentation people or the operations people, they want to be able to have a um, more of a, of, a, of a digital twin, a pure digital twin where it's a simulation of the actual plant without all the photographic detail. So what we've done in, in Talent Swarm is create a, a repository of those different data streams um, and most importantly, what you'll see is that we allow the, the users to tag uh, in 3D space each of the pieces of equipment so that they can then link that to instrumentation uh, data, or they can also overlay uh, 3D images from the suppliers so that they can create a 3D model of their plant 
uh, with the actual equipment that they've been supplied with. This is the point cloud. You can see BIM is the, the uh, 3D model. Uh, CAD is the, is the CAD information and TOUR is the photographic. And here what we're doing is placing assets that are in a, in a CFOS standard database and we place them with millimetric precision. Here, what we're doing is using the point cloud to place actual objects overlaid on the point cloud so that we create the model on the fly. And here you can see uh, an image of a person, the idea that, that I'll discuss further, uh, which is the immersive collaborative environment that we're creating. The idea is that some of the, some of the point clouds can be then rendered into 3D models like this one, um, in which we can then attach mathematical, we can then attach mathematical simulations to create a simulator of the entire facility. Once we have those, those simulations, sorry, once we have those models, we can then use those models to do very sophisticated training, like you can see in this video, using a HTC virtual headset where the operator is using the simulated model to be trained with no risk to the facility. In addition to the digital model or digital twin, um, there's some low hanging fruit that can be done to get people used to these technologies. And essentially in, this, in these times of COVID, telepresence has been uh, widely adopted. Uh, we have a device called IB, which is simply a, a high definition camera on a head mounted display connected to a modified Android phone that allows a remote expert to guide a technician that is in the field uh, in real time. Those sessions can also be recorded to train other people uh, before, you know, so that that same process can, so that that same uh, problem uh, can be uh, posted on a library of, or archive of solutions. And there's also the, uh, the head mounted uh, from RealWare, which is in use in a lot of uh, oil and gas facilities. And uh, of course, our friends at Microsoft um, are coming out with the new HoloLens 2, which is a improved version of the HoloLens. This one is shown adapted by Trimble to a hard hat um, for use in uh, industrial environments. We've moved from the old drafting tables to laptop computers and uh, operational control of, of facilities in more and more sophistication. But what we see is that the augmented and virtual reality ability to monitor our industrial plants is very similar in many ways to the video game environments that our sons and daughters are so addicted to. And uh, I actually wrote an article for the Spanish newspaper saying that um, maybe these ex excellent video game players will be the industrial operators of the future. Uh, as we can see that these two images have a lot in common, that uh, the collaborative nature of, of video of, of uh, real-time video games is the same kind of environments that we hope to have in uh, high efficiency in industrial environments. And we're going towards a this kind of immersive collaborative environments based upon sophisticated digital twins that are 
simulating or connected to the actual physical, uh, sorry, that are connected to the physical device. And this is a video of a concept that we're developing at Talent Swarm that is taking industrial plants to an industrial, uh, sorry, industrial plants to a video game level. This would show people in real time throughout the facility geolocated by their um, ATEX uh, devices and with the telepresence capabilities. But of course, the, the new devices that are coming soon, um, like I said, the HoloLens, here's a, a quick video. And this is, this is uh, actually a six-year-old video of what Microsoft calls holographic teleportation. But this is probably much, much more adoptable now, given the fact that we're working remotely from many different places in the world. With, they can see each other in full 3D in real time. The person on the left is not there, is at another facility, but this using these devices, they can feel like they're present in the same space at the same time. They call it holoportation. And the idea is that somebody may be in a in a industrial facility and look over to their right and see a retired person from working from their home, helping that new worker to solve a problem. And the new worker sees the person that is remote as an avatar or that is a, a literal copy of that person. It's not like a, a, a video game like character, but actually a physical scan of that person that is helping them in real time to solve a problem. There are other companies, sorry. There are other companies that are also working on this. This is a com company called Nreal, and you can see that the prices are coming down. The uh, HoloLens 2 is about $3,500. This Nreal is a uh, developer kit, about $1,200. There's also another company called Magic Leap, which has gotten a lot of funding and a lot of press. They're all working to create these devices that will allow our industrial workers to collaborate in real time in immersive digital twins. I would like to end this presentation by giving you a, let's say a shot of hope and of enthusiasm, we are very, very fortunate individuals to be living in a new Renaissance. It, imagine being in Renaissance Italy 500 years ago, um, discovering perspective, discovering all the new sciences, and yet we are in this situation right now with technology, enabling us to do more, better, faster. And I think that we are sort of in this industrial technological renaissance. And those that are agile and quick and are willing to test these new devices, these new concepts and engage their human, um, their, their employees, in the adoption of these, of these techniques, because that is a way for our employees to feel engaged and valuable in a future that is very disruptive and, and threatening to them. And if we make them part of this, uh, both they will thrive and our companies will be able to, to endure the very challenging times ahead. That is the uh, presentation I wanted to give you. And uh, I'm, like I said, very happy to answer any and all questions that you may have. 
Uh, on the screen is um, my email. And I also encourage you to view the other uh, webinars that uh, that Area and Mark ha have put together because um, Area is an organization that has brought together um, companies that are that are working on these projects in this very exciting time and in a spirit of collaboration uh, and cooperation, which uh, is so direly needed in the world today. Um, I think that's uh, what I needed to say. Uh, obviously, there are some other issues like working with uh, open standards, uh, using archives that um, are secure and and prevent and uh, from uh, from hacking because industrial information is very valuable. So, but those those can be left for another uh, seminar and or for individual questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and over to you, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, and I know we had kind of a comment uh, or a question. Uh, even though I know you put a huge amount of work in trying to get the videos to work as well as possible, because we did kind of agree that it's it's a great way of seeing the digital twin from a, uh, a video perspective. But what we're going to do, if it's OK, and I'll, I'll just say this to all of the people, we'll, we'll check out the recording made today. But if it's not quite right and all the videos aren't working, we'll do another recording, Jim, if you're okay with this, and make sure it's um, all the videos work with the voiceover as well. Because uh, I think there's a huge amount of great content and I've seen the videos and I know they're excellent videos, um, but it was kind of difficult to follow that. So I do apologize if things were a little bit laggy and didn't quite present. I think it's still really interesting the, what you spoke about, Jim. Um, so yes, both to, uh, to the um, Colin and Hector who've made comments, we will make sure that the presentation works really well. And my apologies, it didn't quite work out as well as we wanted to do. Um, if anyone's got any kind of last minute questions. Uh, so yeah, we have one here. Jim, could you explain again this point when building the digital twin of a factory, how did you create the 3D models from the machinery? That's a very good question. And actually, there are several uh, brand new tools. Uh, one of them is called Edgewise. Uh, another one is called Point Cap. Uh, Point Cap. Uh, it's a German company. These, uh, this software, uh, Edgewise, literally takes a, uh, a point cloud and it will start to recognize uh, groups of points as uh, pipes, as girders, and even uh, valves and other pieces of equipment. According to Edgewise, uh, they can recognize up to 70% uh, of those objects. So you literally get a, it's kind of like tracing over the point cloud and you then replace the points with actual uh, 3D objects. That's what we're, I, what I was showing in one of the, the talent swarm videos that what we want to do is create a, a, a digital twin very quickly. So what we do is we create the, the point cloud and we have the photographic virtual tour. That gives us some utility immediately for maintenance people, but the operations people aren't interested in so much photo photographic detail. What they want is sort of like the, the Tinker Toy or Lego version of the plant. So for them, the model, getting to the model quickly is the most important. Um, it is very, it, it can be a very intensive process to go from a brownfield point cloud to a 3D model, but there are tools that are helping us do that. And one of the things that we've decided to do with Talent Swarm is to have the suppliers give us the the pieces that we can literally just overlay on the point cloud. So we're creating the model on the fly as required in those areas that might be more critical. 
and leaving the other areas sort of undocumented um, until more uh, perhaps computerized or automated tools can help in that process. Another question that might be on people's mind is, you know, how much does something like this cost? Uh, we, we did some cost analysis, not only on the Safir desalination plant, but other plants in Germany. And what we're finding is that the cost um, is coming down from about 10 euros per square meter. Um, but that price is going down because those, for example, that three, that uh, laser scanner on the tripod that you saw, that device is, it costs about a hundred thousand euros. Uh, the BL, the, uh, the Leica BLK2 Go scanner is now about 25,000, but these devices now can be rented and you literally can outsource the scanning of your facility uh, to a variety of companies that offer the service. They will give you the point clouds and the photographic 360 images that you can then um, bring into a variety of different tools like AutoCAD, Recap, Revit, and start to create those 3D models. Um, the other thing that we've done is that once we, we you have that 3D model in 3D with 3D precision, we then create points in space that we connect uh, op an OPC UA server to, so that we can actually um, show in bubbles over the equipment the the real time information of that device directly from the instrumentation data. We're not controlling anything yet, but we're giving the maintenance people the capability of walking through the plant uh, with maybe a tablet or, or a phone without having to use these fancy uh, augmented reality headsets yet. But the idea is to take the first steps so that your people feel like they're moving into the industry 4.0 uh, industry 4.0 era. Okay, Jim, I think that's um, a good way to leave it there. So I um, want to thank everybody and apologies for the few um, technical issues, but I think what we'll be able to do is just put the videos into Jim actually talking what he said here and you should have a full uh, a full good recording and, and Jim will follow up also with uh, links to the HD presentation as well. So Jim, I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody for attending the um, the webinar as well. Um, the, again, to remind you, there's one next week um, and the week after and there's a whole bunch coming forward. Thank you for your support of the area and uh, look forward to hearing and speaking to you soon. Uh, have a great rest of the day, everybody. Thanks so much, Jim, and goodbye. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody.